Welcome to the Three Things Podcast. I'm David Iglesias, Director of Wheaton Center for Faith, Politics, and Economics. You may be wondering why this podcast is called Three Things. You were probably taught by your parents, like I was, that it was impolite to talk to people about three things, religion, politics, and money. But what happens if your job is to talk about those three things? Well, join me for the next 25 minutes and let's find out. Our guest today is E. Floyd Kwame, a prominent tech pioneer, venture capitalist, and advisor to presidents in science and technology. He received his bachelor's in science from the University of California, Berkeley in electrical engineering, and a master's in semiconductor material science and engineering from Syracuse. We'll talk more about this later, but Mr. Kwame worked at Apple as an executive vice president for sales and marketing in the early years, helped launch an iconic television ad, helped found tech giant company, National Semiconductor, joined a venture capital firm in the Silicon Valley and served on lots of boards, including this one here for the Center for Faith, Politics, and Economics, and finally co-chaired President George W. Bush's Council of Advisors and Technology. He's married to Jean, and they have three grown sons, all University of California Berkeley grads, and not Stanford grads, right? Right, right. (laughs) So... Thank you for your time. Let's start with a little bit of a background. Can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing? Sure. I was born and raised in San Francisco, California, to uh, Norwegian immigrant parents. They came here as, as young adults, so they didn't do any of their schooling here. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm the second of five children, and uh, my dad was a carpenter. My mother worked outside the house as a domestic worker on, on occasion, but was mostly a stay-at-home uh, mom. Oh, that's that's amazing. So you're you're literally the American dream. Yes, I guess so. <laughs> Coming from immigrant parents to great success and blessings. Um, how did you? You know, obviously one of the things that sets America apart is we have lots of choices in this country. And one of the first choices is when you go to college, if you go to college, deciding what to major in. And you chose electrical engineering. Can you tell us why you picked that very difficult science? Well, as a kid, I loved mathematics, and uh, any, anything that had mathematical quizzery around it, I, I, I liked doing. And um, so, when a, a high school teacher asked me once, "What are you going to do when you grow uh, when you get out of here?" And I said, "Well, I, I'd like to become a, a school teacher and teach math." And he said, um, "Well, that, that's fine, but do you know what engineers do?" And I said, "No, I didn't know any engineers." And uh, he said, well, engineering is applied mathematics. And when he, when he said that, uh, that, that rang a bell for me. So that when, when I was accepted into Berkeley, uh, on the first day, you had to declare what kind of engineering you were going to take. And they asked, uh, you know, that question. And I asked back, well, which one has the hardest mathematics? And they said, double E, uh, electrical engineering. And that's how I got into electrical engineering. Um, it was... My so had it been something else, you would have picked, had something else been more difficult, you would have probably picked that then. Uh, uh, most likely, yes. That's remarkable. Uh, and for us non-science types, can you tell us what exactly a semiconductor is? Is this old technology or is this relatively new? No, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty old technology. It goes back to the, to the uh, table of elements. Uh, the thing that is confusing many people is the chemistry, uh, the, the silicon business or the semiconductor business is really a, the applications of, of chemistry. You're, you're driving diffusants into a, a piece of silicon or a piece of germanium in the early days and causing the, it, the, these things to become electronically useful. Uh, so uh, that, that's, that's how it works. And uh, I once had to explain this to a gentleman and introduce it to, to him from the standpoint of playing with uh, magnets as a kid. Uh, when, when you put up the the one end, it drove uh, particles away from that thing. Uh, the other, it turning it the other way around, and it attracted particles. That's exactly what's happening at a semiconductor surface that causes it to be on or off. And you just build those by the millions on a die these days, and uh, that makes very complex things work. Just a quick follow up: How long have semiconductors been around? Uh, who invented the transistor them? effect was was invented in 1948. And uh, the, the, it really became practical with some advances in about 1954. 
So most, uh, most companies in the semiconductor field date themselves, the oldest ones, to the late 50s and then early 60s. And, uh, and then, of course, they went off the charts up from there. Exactly. Uh, in fact, that's about the time you uh, left college and uh, began your professional career in Silicon Valley. Can you tell us uh, what it was like to work there uh, during the very early years of the 1960s and 70s? Yeah, it was, it was very exciting because there was always new stuff going on. Uh, and uh, you were always looking for applications in new areas. I had a phrase that I used in giving talks on the, on the subject of semiconductors that anything using, using springs, levers, stepping motors, or gears was really performing logic, and that was better done in silicon. And if you remember the old adding machines, they were mechanical marvels, uh, or the old uh, cash registers and those kinds of things. Well, all of those have been replaced by the use of semiconductors in, to perform that logic as opposed to those springs, levers, stepping motors, and gears. And so it was those kinds of applications. Now, again, in those very early days, the primary customer was the Defense Department or the space race. We were in a space race for, with Apollo at that time. Apollo, of course, needed semiconductors to build its computers, and I was actually quite involved in that program using that. But uh, uh, probably 40 to 50 percent of everything was defense oriented. But then the commercial applications started to happen with calculators, and then of course personal computers, and then the the, the beginning of the software industry changed everything in the in the late 70s, early 80s. So it sounded like a tremendous amount of change in a fairly compressed amount of time. Yeah, with with new opportunities coming to the table almost daily. Is is it true that the average American uh, there? personal computer has more computing power than what powered a lot of our uh, Apollo space missions? Oh, for sure. Your, 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 uh, your cell phone uh, certainly has more power than the Apollo computer did. That's, There's no question about that. That, that is really remarkable. Yeah. Uh, now, looking back uh, with the 2020 of hindsight, uh, are you surprised that tech or technology became the global economic force that it is now? Actually, I, I, you know, it may sound strange, but I'm really not. We, we talked about doing pretty big things. Now, again, we were a bunch of young people who uh, had lots of dreams, but uh, the application of semiconductors to virtually everything, I, I remember in the early days when we were talking about applying computing to uh, farming and, and leveling fields by mounting computers so that you knew what the slope of the ground was. And, and then, of course, uh, you know, the use of lasers for all kinds of different applications, from, from boring holes to reading things. Uh, our firm was also principally involved, or one of the principal companies that first introduced barcode scanning in, in supermarkets, uh, which, of course, is ubiquitous today. It's, it's everywhere. But it was that kind of a time when, when uh, new ideas were coming to the fore uh, every, every, uh, every day, it seemed like. And you had to focus on, you know, what you were going to, what area you were going to work with. And because customers were, were using your parts for a lot of applications. Um, in your view, what factors led this one very small area in America, uh, Silicon Valley, to have the economic impact it did? I mean, there's, I mean this is a large country. Why, why did everything seem to happen right there? Well, of course, the inventor of the transistor, William Shockley, moved to Stanford, you know, in the early 50s. And so Stanford was right there. Uh, being a Cal grad, I can't give Stanford too much credit, but I probably would be tempted to under, underplay their role. Uh -huh. uh, this, this area, uh, many of the companies started in Stanford Industrial Park. They had an industrial park associated with the university, which was a relatively new idea back in the late 50s to have universities so involved in research, but they were. And, and so I, I think that was a factor. I think the fact that investors saw opportunity in, in these new companies. And then the nature of the investments were, were, were such that uh, people out here weren't asked to put their home up uh, and uh, secure their home. So if the company failed, they lost their house. That just it was never done out here. I mean, you, you work together with the entrepreneur to make something successful. And failure was not, um, was not totally frowned upon. Uh, uh, there was a German book I remember reading as a, as a high school student Lieben auf den dritten Blick, love at third sight. Uh, sometimes deals didn't work the first time with somebody, but there's lots of examples of entrepreneurs who made a success in the second or third project that they worked on. So I think the, the, that entrepreneurial spirit just was is something that uh, is is kind of unique. 
and it, it's, the structure is very different. Now, the, the other thing I'd say is that the invention or the, the creation of the NASDAQ was critically important, and that happened in the early 70s, so that you could gain access to public capital uh, at, at, with terms that were not anywhere near as stringent as those on the New York Stock Exchange. And, and, that, and that, that made funding available also, and, and, and exits for investors where they could, uh, they could sell their shares in a, an open market. Do you think that the entrepreneurial spirit is still as strong now as it was back then, 40, 50? Oh, I think so, yeah. I mean, uh, young people still have lots of ideas uh, on, on things they want to do with, with, with things, uh, and, uh, and it's spreading out. I mean, you know, who would have thought that an Uber would work? A uh, simple program, for, uh, a simple computer program to keep track of where cars are could be used that way. And uh, it's a pretty unique idea. And uh, uh, that's certainly not technology, it's market, but, uh, but it, it's a technology kind of idea enabled by technology. So I, I think there are still those kinds of opportunities. And nowadays, of course, the medical profession is, is getting very involved in high tech things. Uh, and we, we see that. And, we see it in, in so many different uh, uh, different fields that are, are more consumer oriented. Well, that's right. Um, so now, at one at some point in your career, early 1980s, you joined Apple. How did you first hear of Apple, and what made you want to work uh, there? Well, the Valley has always been a you know a pretty small place in many respects, and uh, I had uh, a number of people in my organization at National uh, who who went over to Apple in in its early days. And uh, when they were looking for an EVP of marketing and sales, it turns out three of the direct reports to that position were people who had formerly worked for me at another company, um, mostly at National. And uh, so uh, they suggested my name to the fellow who was CEO at that time, who I had also helped hire into the Valley uh, 15 years earlier. So uh, I knew I knew the CEO, and Mike Markla was his name. And... Um, um, so Mike gave me a call and, and told me about what was going on at Apple. It sounded exciting. It looked like it had a lot of variety, which is what I liked in the semiconductor field. And at that time, actually, I was president of a company called National Advanced Systems, which was selling mainframe computers. And that was a little boring, frankly, and not having quite the variety that semiconductors had. So the variety in an Apple was, was uh, very, very convincing. So, uh, and, it was, and it was exciting. Well, and, and obviously, at some point, you must have run into uh, one of the founders, Steve Jobs. Oh, of course. Yeah, everybody met Steve at Apple. Now, uh, again, I was, the, you know, I went from being the, the, the young guy in the, uh, in, on the company block to the old guy when I went to Apple. Uh, I, was, I was in my 40s. I mean, that was, uh, heaven forbid you even got to your 40s in that environment. Uh, most, of, most of people were, were, of course, in their 20s. But uh, Steve was an unusual person to work with. And and always kept things pretty exciting. Can you share some of your recollections of, uh, of Steve as you worked there? Sure. Steve was an absolute perfectionist, and it showed in the company's product. Uh, he, uh, he, he really enjoyed uh, computing, and he, but, he, but he was also very, very stubborn about how precise it had to be, how right it had to be. And it, it showed in Apple's products, even down to the, the white boxes, uh, when we were introducing the Macintosh, for example, uh, he made a visit to our factory at which point he, he rejected the boxes because they weren't the right white, uh, if you can imagine, uh, the shipping cartons. But he, he, he had a vision of the company that was, uh, was uh, very, very precise and, and he, he stayed with it. And, uh, uh, you know, and in fact, if you think about it, it's part of what computing brought to people. It was no longer necessary to, to retype a piece of paper. You could, you could have perfect papers that had been error checked just within the computer. Uh, so it was, it was really selling what computing really could do for, for, for a, a user if they applied it properly. Well, no, I have memories of my Smith Corona Selectric uh, typewriter yeah. in college. And then just literally a year or two later, I started noticing um, Wang um, word processors in the law firms that I clerked at. And I, I just thought, you mean, you mean I don't have to pull out a piece of paper and retype everything? I mean, that was, right. it was marvelous. Right. Yeah, yeah. So Dr. I, Wang was an interesting character also, by the way. I did have a chance to meet him once. 
Or it's the, really uh, remarkable how many people, the early, earliest pioneers you met. Uh, did, did you meet them at conventions or in business meetings? Or, or man, I'm selling them parts. Oh, okay. Because uh, they all use semiconductors, and, and we had a pretty, pretty good line of semiconductors, both at National and at, at Fairchild, that were kind of leading edge for, for that kind of application. So we, we met a lot of people. So it sounds like the semiconductor is the building block of the modern computing age. No question. I mean, it's, that's, if it wasn't for semiconductors, there wouldn't be um, a, uh, a Facebook, a Google, or any of that kind of stuff. It's, it all depended on, on semiconductor computing. That's, that's really helpful for me to understand that. Uh, I've also uh, read, uh, I think this is true, that uh, in your role as the uh, EVP for sales and marketing, you, you were instrumental in, in, in uh, deciding to air the iconic 1984 ad for Apple uh, during the Super Bowl. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that was quite a thing. Uh, yeah, that was, that was a fascinating experience. I, I actually, I have to give credit to the, to the ad agency, Shia Day, who actually came up with the idea for the ad. And we had very gr grandiose plans for running it across all the uh, – the uh, college pro, pro uh, bowl games on January 1st when they used to all run on January 1st. But then the economics didn't allow that. Our budget didn't allow that. Our, our late 83 wasn't particularly uh, on plan from a cost standpoint. So we decided to run it on Super Bowl Sunday. And um, that was going to be toward the end of the month. And uh, I, I had great fears that the, the concept of 1984 would be used up in so many ads by that time, the whole thing would fall on its face. But we went ahead with the plan. Uh, unfortunately, uh, not fortunately, not unfortunately, but fortunately, we showed the, 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 the ad to the sales force at our sales meeting in Hawaii that year, and they loved it. They went nuts with, with the ad. Unfortunately, though, in December, the board rejected the ad and gave me a, instructed me to sell the time. Uh, <laughs> now, you're going to hear a story of insubordination here. Uh, the Friday before the ad was to run on the Sunday, uh, Bill Campbell and I met with a lady named Jean Richardson, who handled advertising at that time, worked for Bill, Bill reported to me. And uh, she came in and said she had an offer for the time. We had paid $910,000 for that minute, and somebody was offering us $700,000 for the minute. And Bill and I looked at one another and said, I didn't hear anything. So we went ahead and ran the ad, turned down the offer, and it turned out that it, was, it, it ran and it, it excited everybody and became out of the decade, out of the century, I don't know, out of everything, it was, it was a huge success. And allowed us to play it many more times after that for gratis. Companies, uh, uh, it, there was so much buzz in the industry about this ad that it ran for quite a number of uh, times after that. But it, we only paid for it once. Well, that's fascinating. So it makes me think of in the political world, uh, there was a, an iconic ad in 1964 of a little girl counting daisies, she's counting down, and then when she gets to zero, there's a, a hydrogen bomb blowing up. And uh, it was an yeah. attack ad that LBJ uh, launched against Barry Goldwater. Um, oh, yeah. That, that ad only ran one time. Oh, really, huh? Yes. <laughs> yes, I, I've heard of the ad. I didn't realize it only ran once. Yeah, it's, it's probably the most famous or infamous attack ad ever. Yeah. Uh, well, but that's amazing. You were able to only uh, run at one time and oh, we only paid for it one time, but it yeah. assumed a life of its own. Well, we were very fortunate because had 1984 been a theme for the three weeks before that ad ran in 1984, it could have been a disaster. But fortunately, that didn't happen. As a matter of fact, I'd never heard of another ad that featured the 1984 theme uh, in, in an advertisement. We, we were unique in that. Yeah, well, I mean, it helps to get somebody, uh, uh, a director, um, as famous as who you've got, the famous movie director, yeah, Scott, Scott. who yeah. did a lot of science fiction and is quite well known. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it sounds like there was a lot of bubbling going on, a lot of synergy and things were happening. Uh, was it hard to leave Apple or, or was it? Yeah, hard to move it, on? It, it was. They were going off in a direction that um, was a little different than, than what I thought my opportunity could be. And candidly, the, the Clarence Perkins people made an offer I couldn't refuse. And, and it gave me also a bit more time to do other things. Um, and uh, so I, I, um, I did it. And 
again, that was very exciting. The variety in, in the venture capital field is is enormous. We everything from bugs and drugs to bits and bites. We we we, we were involved in it. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to that in a second, but I'd like to go back a few years because before Apple, uh, you were with uh, National Semiconductor. Um, right. You ended up being the general manager of their operations. And if my information is correct, uh, their annual revenue grew from $30 million in 1971 to close to $1 billion just nine years later in 1980. How, how can you look right. for this spectacular growth? That seems. Well, the seventies were an era of tremendous growth for the semiconductor industry. I mean, that's when the, the the calculator uses. That's when the gaming, you know, the Palm game and many other games started. That that's when uh, people started to see semiconductors in all kinds of applications, and uh, with with microchips at that point in time, essentially being entire calculators or computers uh, with the eighty eighty and. And, and also coupled with the fact that semiconductors had moved in and to replace cores in the memory part of the machine, um, it was a huge time of, of, of growth for the semiconductor industry. Well, in fact, funny you'd say Pong because I remember being a mid-school kid playing Pong. Um, mm -hmm. My parents were taking grad courses at the University of Oklahoma with the Wycliffe Bible translators, and there happened to be one Pong machine in, in the common area, and I, I, yeah. I spent hours playing it. So Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so National Semiconductor and then Apple and then the venture firm, the venture capital firm, uh, you, you've also served on a lot of boards, including the board for, uh, for this center, the Wheaton Center for Faith, Politics, and Economics. But given the, the demands on your time, how do you decide what to do? Because it seems like everybody's tugging at you and have been for decades. Well, I, I have a theory of board membership that's, um, uh perhaps a little unique, and I think I've mentioned this to you in the past, it sounds humorous at the front, but let, let me just go through it. I say that there's two questions you have to ask before every board meeting. Question one, should we fire the CEO? Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that, that's a play on the fact that you are responsible for that hire, and that hire better be doing the job, or you got a problem. Now, you always pray that the answer to that question is no, uh, but the second question then comes in, into play, and that is, how can I help? If I think I can be helpful and know something about the industry involved, uh, I'll, 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 I'll do it and, uh, and enjoy doing it. But uh, if, if I don't know enough about the industry involved and don't know the circumstances of it, I, I don't want to be learning on, on that company's uh, you know, credit card. Uh, I either bring something to the party, uh, and, and, and it's not that I want to be in, in management of the company, it's just I, I want to try to be helpful because, you know, building businesses is hard work. And uh, you, you have to have realistic, you know, goals and realistic times. And, and uh, it's, uh, you have to, have, you know, build relationships with, with, with people and particularly with, with CEOs that you work with and um, uh, have, a, have a trusty relationship. Also, you have to face the fact that the CEO position can be a very lonely one. And uh, sometimes they, they need some place to turn. And if you can offer that opportunity for them so that they can uh, be allowed to think through what they're, what they're going through, that's a huge value to them. And, and, and uh, your name doesn't have to go with that. Uh, but uh, it's, I, I think relationships are, are a key part of that. But that's how I look at it. Well, it's interesting you say that because the current acting secretary of the Navy uh, it's a former boss of mine, and many years ago, we went on a run on Coronado Beach, and he said, you know, David, everything in life boils down to relationships. It does. And, you know, it, it made an impression then. That was probably 15, 20 years ago. But the older I get, the more I realize how wise that, that statement yeah. is. So, um, so after Apple, you went into the venture capital firm. Uh, and I'm not asking for any secret uh, formula here, but how do you determine what to invest money in and what not to? I mean, I'm sure th thousands of people or lots of people want you to invest and, and you can't obviously do it for everyone. So what are your well, big picture going, thoughts? Going back to our just uh, discussion we just had, um, the venture business, you're not investing in a company, you're investing in a person or a mm -hmm. team. Mm -hmm. and you got to keep that in mind and they believe something is doable and you may not know if it's doable or not 
and and uh, many many times it's not it's not knowable whether it's doable. Uh, you're you're inventing something. It's maybe a test. What we used to call a technology risk investment. They, they think they can do some magical thing from a technological point of view. And if they can, it could, it could be wonderful. And if they can't, well, write that one off. Um, so uh, as, as, you, as you look at it, um, you know, you, you set parameters down that say, okay, let, let's take it, uh, you know, taking the, the, the risks out of the deal. How do we do that? What's the biggest risk we have something? Let me, let me back up for a second. Think about it this way. If somebody walks into your office and says, I have the cure to cancer, do you need a sales department? Of course not. Yeah. You don't need a marketing department. You, don't need, you need to know, do they have the risk, the, the cure to cancer? Right. And so if you put all your money behind that and you say, okay, it's going to take you know, 18 months to do that. We'll fund this thing for 18 months. And then 18 months from then, uh, if you have a cure to cancer, you know, God bless you. It's wonderful. If you don't, what do you have? Do you have anything that's doable or do you shut it down? Uh, and, and some hard decisions are made that way because more in a typical venture firm, more than half the investments they make in any one fund fail. Uh, and, you know, because they had a dream and the dream didn't, didn't work out. There's nothing wrong with the dream not working out. It's just recognizing that that's, that, that's important. And you have to you know, face the facts of, of where you are and where you thought you could be. So, and, and this makes perfect sense in, in relation to what you were talking about, Steve Jobs, that uh, he was a perfectionist. And it seems that that culture he helped create was foundational to Apple becoming the mm -hmm. economic force that it was. That had it been any other co-founder who maybe was not a perfectionist, that they may not have uh, achieved the same level of success. Um, I, think, I think that's well said. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, and bringing this home a little bit, Floyd, um, what are some of your biggest successes and failures? Um, and can you tell us which companies you invested in or which persons you invested in, uh, that went public that the audience would know of? Well, the firm, we had a unanimous, uh, voting thing at the firm. Everybody had to agree to invest in it before we made it. And I wasn't directly in the board of a number of the companies that were that were the big, big, big winners. But we were founding investors in Google, oh my. We were investors in Amazon, we were founding investments in Sun Microsystems, we were founding investors in Genentech, we were founding investors in any one of a number of companies. I, I'm forgetting a whole lot of them. Now, the ones I went on the board on uh, that I invested in are are not as well known as that. But uh, uh, you know. A, a company that's a, a lead company in semiconductors today called Power Integration. So we started from, you know, two or three people in the room, and and they they are they own the, the business of converting the DC voltage to the AC voltage to the DC. The, the little plug-in that you plug in the wall to charge your battery, uh, they basically have the chips that are inside that 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 work, and and that, that's it's become a, a three billion dollar market cap company. Um, uh, a, a company that, uh, and I just left that board actually at, at, as chairman last year. The other one I just recently left was a company called Harmonic, which is, uh, you know, all the fancy things you see done on television that the, the Comcasts and the satellite companies all put after you. All that forming of, of that video, video management is done by that company. And uh, they're, they're very good at, at how, you, how you do that stuff and um, in the whole video field. Um, you know, prior to that, uh, uh, companies that, that are m much more esoteric in the, in the formation of silicon wafers, which you would certainly never have heard of, um, and 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 then some some that uh, you know uh, that were in that field that were failures. Uh, I, I believed in X-ray lithography before it came into being, and part of the problem is it never did come into being. Uh, so we invested that, and, and and the company didn't didn't make it. Uh, but like I say, there are there are numerous of those as well. But uh, it, it's been a, it's been a great time to be in the venture field in the '80s and '90s and and, and through uh, 2010. I pretty much dropped out of active investing when I went into the Bush administration. But uh, it was an exciting time to see a, a lot of interesting people's dreams come true, and uh, and and watch those those companies grow. 
Well, then that's a perfect segue to, to a quote. Uh, and I think you'll be able to identify who said this about you. He is an, 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 uh, he is an, an entrepreneur. He is a risk taker. He understands risk and reward. He knows the players, the people that can uh, bring good, sound advice to this administration. Join us for the second half of this podcast where Silicon Valley pioneer Floyd Kwame answers my questions and shares about his faith and its impact on his life in both the business and political sectors. You've been listening to a podcast from the Wheaton Center for Faith, Politics, and Economics. You can find us at wheaton.edu slash ft.